Welcome to ECE 165. This is now going to be our first lecture on sequential logic. We've been spending a lot of time, uh, in fact, most of the course, speaking about what we call combinational logic. And yet we've always mentioned things like how fast can we clock a circuit and so on. And, you know, frankly, that hasn't really made a whole lot of sense. And it won't until we complete our discussion on sequential logic, after which, hopefully, it should make a lot of sense. So let's go ahead and get started. We'll, we'll label this as a new section, sequential logic. So let me go ahead and double box that. Here we go. Okay, and if you were following along in the textbook, that would be chapter 10 in West and Harris, uh, or chapter seven in Rabai, Chandrakasan, and Nikolic. Okay, so what do we mean by sequential logic? We actually defined this earlier uh, in a lecture. We said the outputs for sequential logic are a function of both the current and the previous inputs. Okay, so in other words, a sequential uh, design has some notion of state. There's some sort of memory element that makes the current outputs a function of the current inputs and the previous outputs. So we, we drew that um, in a previous lecture as follows. We have some sort of combinational logic block here. Combinational logic. It has a certain number of inputs. Okay, these create a certain number of outputs, but then there's some memory element where some of the outputs go into that memory and then come back as inputs into our circuit. Okay, and so the study of sequential logic is effectively how do we build these memory elements and then how do we use them in real circuit design. Okay, so um, memory in circuits is typically implemented with one of two methods. It's typically implemented. I uh, sorry, uh, no colon there. Um, is typically implemented using either one of two things. It uses either positive feedback, which is something that we've always been very scared about uh, when we talk about analog design and for frankly, for, for very good reason. In digital design, we very much use positive feedback to a good effect. Uh, and this is what we call static storage, or we can build uh, memory elements using charge. And this is what we would call dynamic storage. And uh, you could probably infer how we're going to build memory elements based on our study from the last lecture in dynamic logic. Okay, so given that we can build circuits with positive feedback or by relying on charge, we're going to get into how we actually build those circuits at the transistor level first. But before we do that, I want to take just a few moments and talk about some of these basic building blocks that we want to build. We need to understand their functionality before we can understand how to implement them at the transistor level. So the main, or I suppose the, the most basic uh, memory building blocks are the following circuits. We have a circuit called a latch. Just draw to some box. Again, we're going to study what the transistors look like when they come in to this uh, circuit uh, in a moment. We have an input D, an output Q, and we have some sort of clock signal that comes into the latch. And then the other circuit element is what we call a flip-flop or a register. Okay, so again, it also has an input D, also has an output Q. Uh, and the only difference in the symbol is we have that little triangle, triangular thing uh, at the clock pin. Okay, so we call a latch a level sensitive 
memory element, and we call a flip-flop an edge sensitive memory element for reasons that should hopefully be clear very soon. Okay, so first of all, a little bit of uh, nomenclature. FF stands for, um, I guess it's already written there. We can just say what it stands for. It stands for flip-flop. Uh, or some people call it a register. Uh, in fact, the, the word flip-flop is arguably a little ambiguous in terms of what it means. Uh, so perhaps it's not the best way to describe it. And so, <clears throat> for example, the Rabbi Chandrakasa Nikolic book doesn't call them flip-flops. It calls them registers. The West Harris book does call them flip-flops. I would say for the most part, people in industry call them flip-flops. So I think that's a fine name uh, to, to use, but uh, just be aware that there are various names that, that people use for these. Um, and this little triangular thing here on the clock pin, the triangle means that this device is what we call edge triggered. And again, we'll get into what that means um, effectively in the next slide. Okay, let's try and understand what this uh, level sensitive and edge sensitive uh, behavior means. And to understand that, as we have done in the lectures on dynamic logic, the best way to understand this is through drawing a timing diagram. Okay, so uh, let's imagine that our clock looks something like this. Very good. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring down some vertical lines here to help make sure we understand the, the timing of these signals and so on. So let's imagine that this, this is our clock signal and we have an input D. And let's imagine that input D looks something like this. Uh, yeah, something like that. Okay. So our job with these uh, latches and flip-flops is to figure out, well, what happens at the output? Okay, so let's look at the output for a latch. All right. Um, now, it turns out the behavior of a latch is such that the latch is what we call in the transparent mode when clock is high, and the latch is in the hold mode when clock is low. Okay, so we can just go ahead and write that down so that the latch has transparent and hold modes. Okay, so um, what happens? So if the latch is in the hold mode, then that implies it's just holding whatever value it had from before. Now in this timing diagram, we've started with clock in, clock low, so the latch is starting in the in the transparent mode. We don't know what the heck the circuit was in, in what state it was in before. So frankly, we just don't know what the value is. And so what we'll do is we'll draw it as both one and zero. We just simply don't know. So we'll just do something like this. It's it's one of one or zero. We just don't know which value it was. Okay. And then when the clock goes high, we enter the transparent mode. What this means is that whatever is at the input gets replicated after some propagation delay to the output. Okay, so here we say, ah, now we know what, uh, what if we're a one or a zero, we're now a zero because input D was zero. Now, as we said, the, the output will follow the input after a brief propagation delay. Um, so that would be the D to Q delay here. And then once the uh, transparent mode ends, then um, it just holds. So we can actually complete the timing diagram for the, for the hold mode, regardless of what the input is doing. Okay, so in this case, the input rose during the hold mode, but the latch was holding state. Uh, so the output was not changing. Uh, and so we can just complete our timing diagram in that manner. Now, once the latch re-enters the transparent mode, then all of a sudden the output must now follow whatever is set at the input. So in this case, the input was one when we entered the transparent mode, and so therefore it's gonna go high. Now, in this case, we actually have a clock to output Q delay. That's what's setting the, the, the delay in this particular circuit, okay? So that's how a latch works. A flip-flop works in a somewhat similar way, except we say that the flip-flop 
uh, in this particular case is positive edge triggered. We can build flip-flops that are negative edge triggered. We'll mostly be talking about positive edge triggered flip-flops unless otherwise, otherwise indicated. Okay, and so basically what this means is the, the function of a flip-flop is that at the instant of the rising edge of the clock, the flip-flop will sample the output and pass it through to the output. Under no other time in the clock period is the input affecting the output. Okay, so in this case, uh, we haven't seen a positive edge clock at the start here, so we don't know what the value is. So it's either one or zero, we just don't know. Now, once the clock rises, then we say, ah, input D was zero when the clock was rising. So therefore our output is going to be zero. Now, even if the input changes during when clock is high, it doesn't matter. That's not the function of a flip-flop. The function of a flip-flop is to sample the input signal at the rising edge of the clock or at the negative edge of the clock if we're dealing with a negative edge triggered flip-flop. But again, mostly we talk about positive edge triggered flip-flops. It samples the signal, it was zero. And so you know what? It just holds it for in, until the next clock cycle. Once the next clock, clock cycle hits, the rising edge of the clock, it says, okay, what's the value of input D? Ah, D is one. So therefore, I'm gonna be logic one for the remainder of the cycle. And in this case, again, we have a clock to Q delay that's happening here, okay? So what a flip-flop does is, uh, let's just write this here, a flip-flop quote unquote samples and it's actually quite a good use of terminology here. It's input at the rising edge of clock. Again, for a positive edge triggered flip-flop, it's the rising edge um, and passes it to the output and passes this value to the output. Okay, so let's maybe just go ahead and circle that. So that's the functionality of a flip-flop. Now we're gonna get into the circuit design details and so on a little bit later, and we'll see that this is a rather general statement and the specifics are a little bit more complicated, but in general, that's the desired behavior of a flip-flop or a register. So now that we understand the basic functionality of latches and flip-flops, it's time to get into a little bit of the weeds in terms of timing definitions. Now, we're going to introduce a little bit of alphabet soup here. There's gonna be lots of different definitions that we all have to understand uh, and be uh, very capable of, of working with when we're analyzing circuits. So just beware, a uh, little bit of forewarning here. So let's go ahead and imagine that we have some combinational logic. Things we've been studying all along. Okay, so it's some combinational logic. We have an input A that goes into the combinational logic and comes out as output Y. Okay, so I'm just going to rehash some of the definitions we've uh, we know and understand already. But if we have A and we don't know if it's one or zero, but it's it's one or the other, and A transitions. So again, we don't know if it's one or zero, but we know it's switched states. This is how we'll indicate this. Then Y is also either one or zero. We don't know the function of the combinational logic gate yet. And after some delay, Y is gonna switch. And after some even more delay, Y is gonna switch again. Okay, so you might be thinking, why is Y switching twice? Okay, and specifically we're gonna say the value is not defined in this region here. In the other regions, we know it's either one or zero. We just don't know which one it is. In this region, we say it's actually uncertain. Okay. Now there's two definitions um, that we want to familiarize ourselves with. One is the definition of what we call combinational delay, or sorry, uh, contamination delay. So we'll call that TCD. And then the other delay is the one that we're actually familiar with and we've already studied. It's the propagation delay. All right. Uh, and then just again for your notes here, this kind of hashed out area means 
the value is uncertain. So you might be thinking, well, how is that possible? Well, think back to your adder designs uh, that you've built in your uh, labs, for example. If you may recall, there's some instances where the output of an adder, perhaps you know one of the middle bits or something like this, starts to transition. Maybe it transitions all the way up, but then it realizes, oops, I made a mistake, or rather, I haven't, I didn't have my um, carry propagate all the way through yet. Now I'm going to come back down. That's what we're talking about here. Um, so, for example, in an adder computation. Okay, so uh, let's just uh, label these definitions here. TCD is the contamination delay. So the definition of this is it's the least or minimum delay from from a 50% input threshold crossing to a 50% output threshold crossing. But the output may not yet be stable. And that's how it's different from a propagation delay. Okay, so the output changes, but it's not necessarily stable just yet. Okay, likewise, TPD is the propagation delay. And this is what we're you know, familiar with, uh, the, the words that we've been using throughout this course. This is the worst case delay, 50% to 50%, I'm just not gonna write that down, to a stable output. Okay, um, so when we're computing things like Elmore delays and so on, we're typically interested in the propagation delay because we are interested in the worst case delay to the output. So you might be thinking to yourself, why do we care about a contamination delay if that doesn't really set the speed of the circuit? Well, it turns out it does matter and it matters for actually a very important reason that we'll get into a little bit later. Okay, so that was the definition of a a combinational logic circuit. Let's take a look at the timing definitions for flip-flops. Because there's there's quite a few more definitions that we're gonna need to understand when we go ahead and build our logic circuits. Okay, um, so for flip-flop, uh, the best way to show these timing definitions is by you guessed it, drawing a timing diagram. So let's go ahead and do that here. So let's show the clock, it's stable for a little while, it rises, it's risen for a little while, and then it comes back down, okay? So I'm most interested in, for a flip-flop, certainly what happens at the rising edge, okay? So let's say that input D is, you know, it's the output of an adder, it's uncertain for a little while, and then it finally transitions and it becomes certain at either one or zero. Again, we don't know what, what the value is and, and it stays there for a little while, okay? So there's a definition here from the point where D is stable to the rising edge of the clock. We call this the setup time, T setup, okay? So this is actually a very important uh, definition, okay? So T setup, is the uh, minimum, well, for lack of a better word, setup time uh, that 
D must be stable before the rising edge of, of clock. Oops, of clock, CLK. Okay, so this is important because as it turns out when we build real circuits, we don't have an infinitely small sampling window. We don't just say at the precise instant in time down to the you know uh, single digit femtosecond level that whatever the input is, that what, well, that's what's going to be transferred to the output. Circuits are not infinitely fast, as we found out. They have finite RC time delays, okay? So what this means is that our flip-flop must have the input going into the flip-flop stable for a certain amount of time before the rising edge of the clock. If it transitions after this setup time, before the rising edge of the clock, the flip-flop just doesn't have enough time to properly sample the value. Uh, and as a result, it won't work properly. So we have to guarantee as a designer that we are abiding by this setup time constraint. Likewise, we have a similar constraint on the other end of the, of the clock. Okay, so not only do we have to have our input set up in time, we also have to hold it, T hold, okay, uh, for a certain amount of time after the rising edge of the clock. Okay, so T hold is the minimum hold time to keep D stable after uh, the clock edge. So, so let me just repeat the, the explanation here. If D changes one femtosecond after the clock goes high, then that's really going to mess up how this flip-flop is computing its results um, to the point where it may not function correctly anymore. Okay, uh, and so we have to be careful about that. It, it's essentially, what it means is we must hold D stable for some setup and hold aperture around the rising edge of the clock, simply for the underlying circuit to work correctly. Now, there's uh, two other definitions we may want to know for our flip-flop. Uh, value Q is stable, you know, from the previous uh, edge. And then we have a contamination delay, and then finally a propagation delay before Q becomes stable. So let me just go ahead and perhaps just for clarity's sake, annotate this with a slightly different color. So this would be the T contamination clock to Q delay. And then we also have a T propagation clock to Q delay. So let me just go ahead and write those down. So T, C, C, Q. Again, I, I warned you, we're gonna have a little bit of alphabet soup here. So this is the clock to Q contamination delay. And TPCQ is the clock to Q propagation delay. Okay, so uh, again, remember, because a flip-flop only changes a state on the rising edge of the clock, and therefore that's the only time the output could change is after a rising edge of the clock. And so we reference all of our delays based on the time at which the clock rises. Okay, so that are the delay definitions for a flip-flop. We can now go ahead and look at the delay definitions for a latch. Again, um, the circuits within a clock or within a flip-flop and a latch are different. Uh, the behavior of a latch and a flip-flop are obviously different too, but we just simply draw it still as a box. Okay, so again, let's go ahead and draw a timing diagram to understand uh, these definitions. So again, we have some long clock. I'm gonna draw it a little longer to give us a, ourselves a bit more room. Something like this. There we go. Let's imagine that's our clock. Then uh, let's say D is, you know, some uncertain value for a little while, and then it stables itself out. 
and then it holds for a little while. It becomes uncertain for a little while. And then it stabilizes, holds for a little bit, and then changes yet again. Okay, um, so when it becomes uncertain, we'll say it's okay, there's some uncertainty here. Maybe there's some contamination delay going on from the previous logic set or something like this. All right, so we can go ahead and just draw out what happens to Q. Um, when clock is low, we are in the uh, hold phase. Uh, so we can just say the latch is in the hold mode. And when clock is high, the latch is in the transparent mode. Again, sometimes it's, it's nice just to directly draw that on the timing diagram uh, to you know, keep in, in your mind what, what's going on in the circuit here. So when we're in the hold mode, we don't know what Q is, so it's gonna be stable certainly until that rising edge of the clock, which I will go ahead and annotate down here. Okay, so Q is stable until the rising edge of the clock. Once the clock edge rises, then if there happened to be a change in Q prior to that previous um, rising edge of the clock, there's going to be a contamination followed by a propagation delay. So we have uh, some unknown delay here. And then within the latch, there's some delay when it's in the transparent mode. There's a um, contamination and a propagation delay. And then once we enter the hold mode, the output ceases to change again. Okay, so something like this. All right, now there's a lot of transitions here. Let's go ahead and identify all of them. So first of all, we have um, we actually have a clock to Q delay. We have a clock to Q contamination delay. We'll call that TCCQ. It's exactly the same as our flip-flop case. And naturally, we also have the propagation delay version of that. That's TPCQ, okay? So that's exactly the same as the flip-flop. That, ha that happens if the, del the data input D into the latch happened to have changed prior to the rising edge of the clock. And so once the clock edge rises, the latch enters the transparent mode. And so that new data that's at the input that wasn't there before now propagates through to the output. Now, during the transparent mode, if there's any change in D, then of course we're gonna get some change at Q. It's in the transparent mode. So there's going to be some delay from a change in D to the output, and we call this the contamination D to Q delay, not, not clock to Q delay, but input D to Q delay. And if we have a contamination delay, we also have a propagation delay version, so that's P T P D Q. And then we also have, uh, and let me just put, use a different color here, we also have a setup T setup time issue. Uh, and then we also have a hold time consideration here as well. Okay, so there's a couple new uh, delay definitions. So let me write these down here. So TPDQ is the latch, and this is only for a latch. This doesn't happen for flip-flop. D to Q propagation delay. Delay, here we go. And TPCQ, as you can guess, this is the latch input D to output Q contamination delay. Okay, so again, I warned you, there's a little bit of alphabet soup going on here, but um, but you know, if, if the definitions are all self-consistent effectively, so, so it's uh, reasonable for us to um, try and remember all these words uh, and and uh, variables, hopefully. So now that we have those definitions in the back of our mind, uh, we can start to go ahead now and talk about sequencing methods. So now that we have these memory elements and we know functionally how they behave, we don't know how to build them as a circuit yet, but we'll study that later. Let's figure out how we might use them in a, an actual circuit. Okay, so by far the most popular
method is called the flip-flop based method of sequencing. This is by far the most popular. Uh, in fact, um, this was the method that was implemented in lab four, possibly even without your knowledge because we didn't really talk about it. We just, you know, let it go. Okay, so how does this work? Well, uh, we have our data that comes in to the circuit and it enters a flip-flop. Okay, so let's call this data D1. It enters a flip-flop. The flip-flop is clocked by some signal called clock. It produces output Q1 and then it goes through some combinational logic. Maybe it's an adder or multiplier or something. The output of this becomes what we call D2, which is the input that goes into another flip-flop that produces output Q2. Now this other flip-flop is also clocked with the same clock net. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do something uh, a little, um, hopefully fairly intuitive is what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a timing diagram that happens to also coincide with physical placement, if you will, on this diagram. So I have a clock that goes up and something like this. So what I'm trying to convey here is that the clock edge arrives at the flip-flops at the same time, uh, but my x-axis here also happens to be you know, a rolling time axis, if you will. Uh, and this allows us to, to kind of nicely see that the clock edges are coming to the flip-flops at the same time. So what we say here is that the time or the, yeah, I guess the time between the rising edge of the edges of the clock is what we call TC. And the clock frequency is just equal to one over TC. So when you hear about a processor that's clocked at four gigahertz, uh, it means the clock period TC here is one over four gigahertz um, in, in units of time. So this is by far the most popular way to do sequencing. Because it's the most popular, we're gonna focus most of our attention and energy on it, but we also do wanna introduce, there are other ways that we can do sequencing. Okay, um, and they do happen in kind of specific niche applications. There's something called a pulsed latch sequencing method. Okay, and so the idea here is we have two latches, we'll call this L1. We have input D1 coming in here. This generates output Q1. It goes into some combinational logic, just like we had above there. Creates an output, we'll call this D2 that goes into a second latch L2 that generates output Q2. So, so far, exactly the same. But now what we're going to do is I'm gonna create a signal called phi P and I'm going to inject it into these two latches. Now, what we're going to do with phi P is basically, again, I'm gonna draw a timing diagram. I'm gonna make phi P kind of make the latches run very similar to a flip-flop. So remember, the latch is only transparent when the clock is high. A flip-flop only passes as input to its output on the rising edge of the clock. So if we make the time at which during the latch is high very short, then it kind of starts to mimic the behavior of a flip-flop. Okay, so we say that the distance or the time here is T PW, this is the pulse width, uh, and the clock frequency is just, you know, the, the, the period or one over the period of this pulsed signal. Now you might ask, why would we do this instead of just the flip-flop method? The answer is it turns out that it's slightly easier to build latches. Uh, they're less com complexity, they're a little smaller and so on. Uh, and so, you know, if you're really, really tight on area or something, this might be a good way uh, to possibly save some area. In practice, it doesn't really help that much, especially if you are combinational logic uh, limited. Um, and so most people end up don't doing this because there's other issues that kind of come out uh, when you do this. So most people use the flip-flop based method instead.
There's a third sequencing method that's actually really quite interesting. Um, it's not, I would say, super popular, but uh, it does have some interesting advantages called two-phase clocking. Okay, and so the idea here is you take a latch, we'll call it L1, have our input D1 just like before, which creates an output Q1. Okay, so, so far, exactly the same thing. This goes into some combinational logic. But now let's imagine that this combinational logic is smaller. Okay, maybe it's half of the combinational logic we had from before. This generates input or an output called D2 that creates goes into a latch we'll call L2 that creates an output Q2 that goes into perhaps the other half of the combinational logic that we had before, which finally goes as an, into latch L3. This is D3 and Q3. Okay, um, the latches are clocked with signals, we'll say phi1, phi2, and phi1 again. Now, just to make a note here, we'll say that these two combinational logic pieces are, um, basically we split the combinational logic from before into two halves. Okay, uh, just so, so this is computing the same logic function as before, we've just done it slightly differently. So again, I'm gonna do this kind of diagram where I, I, I map physical space to time. Uh, so let me plot the first clock here. So clock phi one has a rising edge here, falling edge somewhere over here and then it doesn't rise again until over here. Uh, similarly, phi two looks something like this. It doesn't have a rising edge until the rising edge of clock phi two here, and so on. Okay, so basically what this is creating is what we call a non-overlapping clock signal so we say the time between these two rising edges is equal to the clock period over two. And then the time between the falling edge of one clock and the rising edge of the other clock is what we call the non-overlap time. Okay, so this might look a little strange. Now we need two clock signals going to our different circuits and so on. Why would we do this? Um, we're not gonna get into that discussion right now, uh, but we will get into it a little bit later and, and hopefully it'll make sense why one might choose to do this, although we don't typically choose to do it very often. Okay, so with those uh, definitions out of the way, let's talk about some delay constraints and maybe try and analyze how we could get these circuits to run as fast as possible. So ideally, um, I'm gonna write up here, ideally we want all of TC, all of the clock period to be available to combinational logic. Right, the flip-flops aren't actually adding any computational functionality. They're just delaying things, they're holding things and so on, right? So if we're building a big computer, we don't care that the computer is really good at holding data for you know nanoseconds at a time or however long they, they do this for. We care that the computer is good at computing things and computing things fast, all right? So ideally, we'd like to introduce this notion of flip-flops without them having any overhead whatsoever. However, latches and flip-flops have delays. These are not ideal circuits. They have clock to queue delays and setup times and hold times and so on. So we call this, this sequencing overhead. We call it sequencing overhead. And this sequencing overhead takes some time 
uh, ETC away from the combinational logic. Okay, so that's not good news, actually. We would love to have all of our time available for a combinational logic because that's what's doing our computation. But because we've introduced these, say, for example, flip-flops, they are starting to take up some of that clock period. Uh, so let's understand what this means uh, through a simple example. So again, we're going to assume that we're doing the flip-flop method of sequencing. So we have a clock coming in here. We go through some combinational logic here. We go into our flip-flop over here. This is clock. This is D2. And this is Q2 over here. Okay, so what we can do is we can draw one of these uh, timing diagrams. So clock looks something like this, rising edge over here, falling edge somewhere here, another rising edge over here. Okay, so let's drop down some vertical bars to give us some timing understanding here. And let's imagine that Q1, output Q1, we don't know what it was before, one or zero, and then it transitions. We have a contamination delay and then a propagation delay, okay? And then let's say that for the rest of the period, it just holds on, okay? Then Q1 goes through some combinational logic, right? So we have some contamination delay happening. Maybe it's a very long dis distance between the contamination delay and the propagation delay, and then finally it settles out. Okay, so what are the delays uh, that are important here uh, to what's going on? Well, we have a propagation clock to Q delay, TPCQ, propagation clock to Q delay. We have a propagation delay through the combinational logic, that's just normal TPD, propagation delay. And then we have to have the, the data ready, a setup time, T setup, before the next rising edge of the clock. Now recall, the clock period is the time between these instances here. Okay, so what we say here is that we must ensure we must ensure that D2 is stable at least T setup before the next uh, clock edge. I suppose I should specifically say before the next rising edge, okay? So in other words, what I mean by that, if I could perhaps continue writing down here, i.e., this actually sets a minimum clock period. We must have the clock period, TC, be larger than or equal to the propagation clock to Q delay, because that's how, how long it takes for the first flip-flop to create uh, the the output, and I, I guess I didn't label that there, Q1. It must be greater than the propagation clock to Q delay, plus the propagation delay through the combinational logic, plus the setup time, the time that it needs the data to be valid before that next rising edge of the clock. Okay, so this sets our minimum clock period. The minimum clock period is not just the propagation delay of the logic, which is kind of what we've been operating under uh, as assumptions earlier on in this course. But now we understand that, hey, we're building with a real flip-flop, a real flip-flop has propagation clock to Q delays, and we have to abide by this pesky setup time notion. Uh, and so that's going to ultimately limit a little bit of our performance. The other way to think about this is that the propagation delay of the logic must be less than or equal to the clock period minus the setup time uh, and the propagation clock to Q delay 
of the flip-flop. Okay, this is exactly what we mean by sequencing overhead, is the setup time and the propagation clock to Q delay. Okay, so let's just do a quick example. Let's calculate the maximum clock frequency of a circuit when T setup is equal to, uh, let's just pull some numbers out of a hat, 100 picoseconds, T, P, clock to Q, the propagation clock to Q delay is 50 picoseconds, and the propagation delay of our logic, let's say we've built an adder, it's 350 picoseconds uh, to get through that adder block, okay? So the answer is, well, the clock period must be greater than or equal to 100 picoseconds plus 50 picoseconds plus 350 picoseconds. That's equal to 500 picoseconds. So therefore our clock frequency, F clock, must be less than or equal to two gigahertz. Okay, so if we were marketing our microprocessor that had this, let's say call it an adder in it, the fastest we could clock that microprocessor based on these numbers here would be two gigahertz. If we clocked it faster, then we just don't have enough time to make sure that data is ready, a setup time before the next rising edge of the clock, and therefore our circuit will fail. So you might be asking yourself, you know, this is, I guess, interesting. Now I kind of a little bit at least more understand why, you know, when I build a bioprocessor, it has a certain advertised clock frequency, but why are we doing this? You know, can't we just do adders, you know, without flip-flops? Do we really need flip-flops? Um, so I'd like to just address this. What's the point? Why sequence at all? Well, there's two reasons, um, two main reasons, I suppose. Uh, reason number one, is it does give us this notion of state, okay? And that allows us to, for example, build a finite state machine. Okay, so you might remember uh, this from your logic design classes, you know, you have a state over here and a state over here and depending on what the inputs and outputs are, you might transition from one state to the other. Uh, it's possible you could stay at this new state depending on what the inputs and outputs are and so on, something like this, okay? Now it turns out any modern microprocessor or frankly any real you know, practical digital circuit is built out of finite state machines. Uh, it has state, we sequence events and so on. It's really hard to just compute things, you know, all in parallel or all serially without any notion of state. Otherwise it gets very difficult to write programs and so on. So that's one very and possibly the most important reason why we do want to have sequencing elements in our circuits. Otherwise they're just incredibly difficult to program or, you know, um, and so on. So that's one possible reason. The other reason has to do with, uh, and in fact, I'm going to leave the, the name of this uh, um, point here blank for a moment, so, so leave a little bit of room there. I want to talk about an analogy first. Okay, so I'm going to pose a question. What is the best way to deliver oil? This has nothing to do with microprocessors. From the oil sands in Alberta, Canada to Houston, Texas for processing, okay? Uh, ignoring geopolitical arguments and so on. So wh what are our options, right? Well, we could load a bunch of barrels of oil up into uh, trucks, right? And this works perfectly fine, right? You get your barrel of oil, you load it into the truck, you drive the truck down, and by the time the truck gets there, um, you have your oil, okay? This works fine, um, nothing necessarily wrong with it uh, as, a, as an approach. However, the truck can't carry that much oil, okay? So you need a lot of trucks. Um, and although, you know, uh, if once you get your first barrel of oil, you could literally take that first barrel of oil, load it on a truck and drive it down to Houston and you'll get it there in the fastest possible time, 
it's only one barrel of oil. What if you need a million barrels of oil? You need a lot of trucks. Okay, so you know another option might be ships or trains or you know there's there's all sorts of possibilities here. Ships might take a little bit longer uh, because you know a you have to you know bring the 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 oil out to the, one of the coasts, load it on, up onto a ship, have the ship you know go wherever it needs to go. Maybe it has to go through canal so on. Um, it could take a long time, but once it gets there, boy, that's a lot of oil that gets delivered all at once. Now you may be thinking, okay, I, I, perhaps I know where the professor's going here. The third option uh, is a pipeline. Again, geopolitical arguments aside. So a pipeline is interesting. The day you have your first barrel of oil, you don't have a pipeline constructed. In fact, constructing that pipeline is gonna take years. Okay, so there's a long latency until you get the first drop of oil from the Alberta oil sands all the way down to Houston, Texas. Okay, however, once that pipeline is open and running, then you get a lot of oil flowing through. Okay, and it's the most efficient way to geopolitical arguments aside, ship oil. Okay, so that is our preferred solution in general. Um, and the idea here is that uh, for, for pipelines anyways, although latency may be long because it takes a long time to build that pipeline and it takes a long time for the oil to get all the way through the pipeline. Once the pipeline is, is going, then the throughput of getting oil from one destination to the other is excellent. Okay, and so that's exactly our uh, point two here is having state in our digital circuits allows us to implement pipelining, not for digital, or sorry, not for transportation of oil, of course, but for transportation of logic values through a circuit, okay? This may not be clear simply by this description. Uh, so that for that reason, let's go through an example. Okay, so let's start this example. So given, I'm gonna give you a few parameters. Given TPD, the propagation delay of an adder is equal to one nanosecond, let's say. TPD of a multiplier uh, is equal to three nanoseconds. TPCQ, Propagation clock to Q delay is equal to 50 picoseconds. T setup is equal to 100 picoseconds. Which of the following two circuits do you prefer? Okay, so let's go ahead and draw these two circuits. Uh, I'm assuming flip-flops here. And that is, as I mentioned, the most popular way to do things. So we have a flip-flop. This goes into the input of an adder. We'll draw it as a digital adder symbol here. Uh, if you didn't know, that's what a digital adder symbol looks like. So we have our inputs coming in here. Okay. This output then goes into another digital adder. A very poorly drawn digital adder here. Then we go into a multiplier. And then finally, we hit our final set of flip-flops. Okay, so that's one uh, possibility. And I'm, I'm actually, I need to save a little bit more space here. So let me just very quickly redraw this, uh, shaving a little bit of horizontal space. Okay, so that's one possibility. The other possibility versus is, it starts out the same. We have flip-flops going into a digital adder. The output of this adder goes into another digital adder. So again, so far exactly the same. But instead of going uh, directly to that multiplier, we're gonna go into a flip-flop and then we're gonna go into the multiplier. And then finally, another flip-flop, okay? So these two circuits are exactly the same, 
with the exception of this additional flip-flop. All right, so you might be looking at these two circuits and say, well, the one on the left is lower complexity, there's less parts there, so I assume that's better. Well, let's go ahead and calculate it. So let's calculate, first of all, the latency. So the latency is just equal to the delays through all the circuits. So there's 50 picoseconds clock to Q delay, plus two one nanosecond delays through the adders, plus three nanoseconds through the multiplier, plus a 100 picosecond delay through the, um, or setup time, plus a 50 picosecond clock to Q delay. This is equal to 5.2 nanoseconds of latency. Okay. Uh, similarly, the latency over here is going to be exactly the same, uh, except we have one more flip-flop. So we have 50 pico plus 2 times 1 nanosecond plus 100 pico uh, setup time plus 50 picoseconds clock to Q delay plus 3 nanoseconds through the multiplier plus 100 picoseconds setup time plus 50 picoseconds clock to Q delay. This is equal to 5.33 nanoseconds. So, ha, we knew it. This is much longer latency. Why would we ever choose this, this option? Well, um, that's just the latency for getting the first unit of data to the output. What about the clock period? Okay, so TC, in this case, must be greater than or equal to uh, clock to Q delay plus the propagation delay, that's two plus times one nanosecond, plus three nanoseconds through the multiplier, plus the setup time, 100 picoseconds. This is equal to 5.15 nanoseconds. Or in other words, the maximum frequency F max of this circuit is equal to 194 megahertz. Okay, so we can do a similar calculation over here. TC must be greater than or equal to 50 picoseconds clock to Q delay and ah hmm hold on a second there's two inter flip flop delays here there's the delay between the two adders and there's delay between the multiplier so what we have to do is we have to pick we have to clock the circuit conservatively both you know the whole circuit needs to work so effectively the clock period gets determined by the longest possible path between any two flip flops that happens to be through the multiplier path, okay, plus 100 picoseconds. Okay, so let me just uh, go ahead and write that down. So we say this is the longest path between flip-flops. Okay, so this, if you sum it all up, is equal to 3.15 nanoseconds which means that the maximum frequency of this circuit is equal to 317 megahertz. Okay, so which one do we prefer now? So if we, if we care about latency, then yeah, obviously the one on the left is, is preferred. However, if we care about throughput, which is something we generally care more about in computing, then the one on the right is far superior. We clock it faster, right? This is the benefit of pipelining, is even though we're adding some extra elements which do delay things, we do get a direct benefit in that, although it takes longer for the data to get from the input to the output, once the data is in the pipeline, once the, the data passes those first two outers and then gets to the next flip-flop, we don't have to wait for that data to then pass through the multiplier before we can shove new data into the pipeline. In the circuit on the right, once it gets past those two flip-flops, we can immediately shove new data into the pipeline. This is the benefit, okay? Uh, and just to complete the, um, the, the definitions here, clocking overhead is the delay and setup time from memory elements. So we have, you know, some delay that we've added, some latency that we've added because of doing this pipelining, but in many cases it turns out to be worth it.
So, so far we've kind of shown how clock to queue delays, propagation clock to queue delays, that is, and setup times kind of pose the most stringent um, constraints on the design of our sequential circuits. It turns out that flip-flop hold times are also important, but perhaps not in the way that you might think. So flip-flop hold time also imposes a minimum Uh, a minimum delay time for combinational logic. Okay, not a minimum clock period, a minimum delay time for our combinational logic. Now this is a, a very nefarious thing. Okay, um, so pay, please try to pay careful attention here. And I'm going to try and draw this in a timing diagram that hopefully is, is might be a little weird, but hopefully it'll make sense to you. So we have our flip-flop. It has a clock coming in here, CLK. Okay. Its output goes through some combinational logic. And in this case, just for the sake of clarity, I'm going to have uh, a second flip-flop. The output of this combinational logic is going to come down and enter this flip-flop over here. Okay, so this is key one, this is D2, and this is Q2, and this is CLK here. Okay, the only reason I'm drawing it like this is so that um, we have a, a vertical timing edge reference, if you will, in our timing diagram, similar to what we've drawn before. Okay. So let's imagine our timing diagram looks something like this. In this case, we're only interested in looking at what happens precisely on this rising edge or around this rising edge. So let's say Q1 is, is stable before the rising edge. Once we have the rising edge, there's a short period of time and then we have a contamination delay. We have a longer period of time and we finally have a propagation delay, and then the output settles out. Okay. Now, this is where the nefarious behavior happens. All right. Um, so what happens if the contamination delay through the logic is so fast that output Q1 goes through the contamination de delay uh, goes through the combinational logic with a very quick contamination delay all the way to D2 before the hold time of that second flip-flop is up. That would be a problem. Okay, that means the data kind of shoots through this entire, uh, these, these, these two flip-flops all together. It doesn't wait until the next clock cycle. That's a problem. That's not behaving properly. So what we say here for our delay constraint is that Oops, how did that happen? Um, is that this D, D2, has to hold for a hold time after the rising edge of the clock, right? So let's just go ahead and, and draw that hold time in. Okay, so this hold time must be met if our circuits are to work. T hold. Okay, and so the the possibly scary thing that could happen here is we have a contamination clock to Q delay and then we have a contamination delay through the combinational logic and what happens if that contamination delay clock to Q and through the logic is so short that it that it ends up changing D2 before the end of that hold time that would be very bad okay so what this means, if we perhaps uh, go up here, is that T hold must be less than or equal to TCCQ plus TCD. Or in other words, the combinational or the contamination delay rather <coughs> of the logic must be greater than the hold time minus the clock to Q contamination delay <coughs> of the flip-flop. Okay, so let's just write this down in words. In other words, if the hold time 
is longer than the minimum delay through the flip-flop and the combinational logic, So if the whole time is longer than the minimum delay through the flip-flop and the combinational logic, the next flip-flop in the queue in the line may not register or may not sample its input correctly. Uh, and this is a big problem. Okay, so this can occur if you have little to no logic uh, between flip-flops. And you might ask yourself, why would you have no logic between flip-flops? Well, it actually happens more often than you would think. Uh, like for example, uh, in a serial shift register. where you basically just have a, a line of flip-flops that are all connected one to another. So there, the combinational logic delay is zero or whatever the delay of the wire is, right? Um, sort of like a ser serial shift register or scan chain, something like this. Okay, so the way to fix this uh, is to use buffer insertion. So if you have too little delay, well, that's a problem that we can rectify easily by just, well, adding more delay to increase minimum delay. Okay, so the solution to this problem at design time is rather simple. Okay, um, just add extra buffers, no problem. Now you might say, well, you know, can't you just design a flip-flop where this wouldn't happen? Um, and that's true. You, you can design a flip-flop where this, you know, if TCD is zero, uh, this doesn't happen. Uh, however, there's other effects. We're going to get into this, not into the, today's lecture, a little bit later, um, where the arrival time of the clock edges may not be precise, and we may have clock skew. Uh, and so even if you design a flip-flop where this theoretically can't happen, if there's clock skew in your circuit, it might still happen. So I want to throw up a big caution here. I'm even writing it in red. Okay. If the delays on your chip are different after chip fabrication compared to what you expected, which can definitely happen as we've described, you know, there's variation, uh, W's and L's aren't perfectly defined. There's VT variation, supply voltage variation. There's variation with temperature and so on. So the chip that you design in your mind and then subsequently on cadence is never exactly the same kind of chip that you end up getting back because of all these different sources of variation. So if the delays are different after you do chip fabrication than what you expect, how does this affect uh, TPD and TCD? How does this affect the ability for us to sequence circuits? Okay, so let's imagine the following scenario for TPD. This sets the maximum frequency we can clock our circuit at, right? So if TPD is longer than expected, Well, maybe your boss won't be so happy that the circuit is is running slower than expected. 
this, the fix is simple. Simply reduce uh, f max. Okay, just don't clock it as fast. The circuit is still functional. Okay, so again, your boss may not be happy. You said you were going to be able to clock your circuit at 4 gigahertz, and because of process variation, it came back, and we can only get it working at 3.5 gigahertz. Okay, not super happy, but it's still functional. We can still hopefully sell this product. Now, what about the contamination delay? So if TCD is shorter than expected, in other words, if your circuit's a little faster than expected, maybe the threshold voltages came out a little lower than you expect, or the mobilities were a little higher, or something like this, then our hold time condition may be violated. Okay, so that sounds bad, but can't we just clock it faster? Well, that's not how this works, okay? In fact, if this happens post fabrication, there is nothing you can do. Uh, let me put an asterisk there. There's next to nothing you can do about this, uh, except to fix the design, maybe add some buffers or whatever it is you need to do and refab, okay? Now, if this happens, unlike the previous case, your boss is going to be furious with you, okay? If you have a hold time violation, your chip is not functional and there's nothing that to first order that you can do as the tester and designer after the chip has been fabricated. So this is gonna cost the company millions of dollars in fab costs and months of delay and millions of dollars of engineering time as well. Okay, so this is a huge problem, all right? So you definitely don't want this to happen to you. So when you are designing combinational logic circuits, just be very careful to make sure that you don't neglect the whole time. Because again, whole time is not setting performance. Uh, setup times and, and propagation delays through your logic, that's what's setting your performance. So that's what you spend most of your time worrying about and thinking about. But the whole time is this little, you know, simple little thing that if you forget about it and you happen to get a whole time violation, it's possible your entire circuit will fail and you'll get nothing uh, at the output here. Okay, and so this is a really, really important thing for you to pay attention to. Now, I did put an asterisk next to nothing there because, you know, sometimes you can play around a little bit with the supply voltage. Maybe uh, the if you run it at a slightly lower supply voltage or maybe a slightly higher supply voltage, uh, the variation affects the circuit in a slightly different way. And maybe there's some very narrow range that you can get your circuit to work at. But this is, you know, um, trying to uh, make wine out of raisins. OK, it's very, very difficult to do. OK, so. <laughs> What we typically, you know, try and, and, and do in these scenarios is, you know, just be very careful. Make sure that you have enough hold time margin. If you have um, the opportunity to add buffers, do it. Although, of course, adding buffers increases area and power consumption. So this is something to be careful, uh, you know, aware of. You don't want to just add too many buffers all over the place for no reason. But, you know, I have personally seen circuits fail from students designing here at UCSD, from uh, back in my grad school days at MIT, from uh, even circuits in industry fail because people uh, neglect uh, whole time. Uh, and this particularly happens if someone is manually designing a scan chain or a serial shift register or something like this, particularly in the presence of something like clock skew, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay, so the bottom line is just be careful. If you do your design well and make sure you, you know, take care of all this stuff, you'll be okay. Um, just don't forget about it. That's my that's my main point I'm trying to make here.